Mayor Pam Triolo. Here. Vice Mayor Scott Maxwell. Here. Commissioner Christopher McBoy. Here. Commissioner Andy Amoroso. Here. Commissioner John Zerdy. Present. On the EUAB side, Chairperson Lisa Maxwell. Here. Peggy Fisher. Here. Ibrahim Shalou. Here. Caroline Clore. Here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by <coughs> Commissioner McBoy. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, before we get started, if you don't mind me taking this liberty, um, I wanted to, uh, number one, apologize for not being at the last meeting that we had. Uh, it was mine and my husband's 15 your wedding anniversary. Sorry for not accepting the apology. <laughs> so I was, uh, so he surprised me. So anyway, oh, cool. forgive me for that. And uh, and on a sadder note, um, a very you might remember Ed Sherry. He came to a lot of the commission yeah. meetings. Uh, he passed, Aww. and uh, just a, a wonderful man, a kind man, mm -hmm. and also a great neighbor. So if you wouldn't mind, we just have a moment of silence in remembrance of him. Shed. Thank you. Okay, today we're going to discuss the pros and cons of the power alternatives for the electric utility system. I want to thank the, all the members of the EUAB board for being here tonight and for your hard, hard work. Had a chance to sit in on, on one of your sessions recently and, uh, and know how hard you've been working and you're going to bring the fruits of your labor here to this discussion tonight. So if you'd like to take it away, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Commission. Um, let me put this in context a little bit. The last time we were here, we talked about the timeline for the three alternatives that the city would like us to look at. Those alternatives are selling the electric utility, upgrading the electric utility, continuing to purchase power on the open market, and there is another option that actually must be chosen, which is kind of sub three, which we'll talk about tonight. But those were the options and the timelines that we looked at and brought to you at our last meeting. As a result of that, the commission directed our committee to get together <coughs> and put a list of pros and cons for those options together for you. So this is for your consideration. We had... Um, a consultant uh, from, hey, what was his name? Barry Boleyn. I apologize, I'm at that age. Barry Boleyn, uh, who was um, with FMPA. EA. EA. All these acronyms. He came down and facilitated a discussion, not just with our board, but we reached out to community leaders, chair of our boards, invited them to come and participate with us in creating this pros and cons list. Some of the commission participated, we had an excellent showing, and we have the input today from not just the Electric Utility Advisory Board members, but a broader spectrum of people who have been very active in the issue and very informed. So we hope that we have uh, a lot of information to share with you which you will think is relevant to making some of your decisions. So I'm just going to jump into the presentation. And if you could, uh, let me kind of get through the presentation, or I can stop at the end of each alternative for questions and answers. And that way, we kind of keep things flowing. It gets a little crazy otherwise. OK. You may recall, and nobody can see this, but this is the, this is the timeline. I don't know if there's a way to sharpen that or enlarge that clay. Hopefully you have a hard copy of this document. But this is the essentially the timeline for uh, the various options. Now one thing I want to stress about this slide is that no matter which option, which road you go down, B 
because of the time, the commission at this juncture really must consider going out for an RFP to purchase power yet again. That's beyond the two years that you already have established with OUC. We don't, as a committee, think there's time to do any of the other options before the end of your ultimate contract with OUC. Therefore, an RFP will be necessary just to continue to have power going in the city. So that's something we really want to bring to the front burner for you so that you start to think through how you want to proceed with that RFP process. I know there were a lot of concerns and issues with the last go round. We'd like to try to help avoid that this time and have a really kind of transparent and clean process. <coughs> uh, but we don't see any way to avoid that. Um, anything else? Committee members want to say about the timeline? Uh, so you have the dates here. And they're, they're, they're long term. They, it takes a very long time to complete these processes. Some are a decade. So um, getting started, we can't stress the importance of getting started and really thinking about proceeding with some of these choices. So these were the three alternatives that we looked at. Continuing to enter into long-term purchase power agreements on the open market, build a new plant at the existing site, and sell the utility. So the first that we're going to look at is the purchase power agreement. Um, we're, we listed for you all of the all of the input from the committee because we felt very strongly people came out, they had great input, we wanted you to hear it all and have the public have the benefit of seeing it all. But our committee, the uh, advisory board, went through for you and picked the top five in each category, which we thought were the most important of the considerations. So the first slide is gonna, you're going to see are the entirety of the cons, or I'm sorry, the pros, and then, but we're going to show you our top five. Are they there? They were there. Oh, oh. <coughs> that's not that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cute. Fancy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Dancing with the pros. So the first one is, um, main, it maintains the status quo. It um, delays major decisions, and it's probably the most politically powerful. Because it doesn't rock the boat. It doesn't create a drastic departure from what we're used to. Number two, um, this gives us the most flexibility or can in a changing industry. There are a lot of things happening, it's moving very quickly, and this is a, a, a more flexible choice. So in other words, once you sell a utility, it's done. Um, number three, it allows Lake Worth Utility to implement a plan for the long term uh, and, and think about kind of infrastructure investments that you want to have. Number four, we believe that there will be a buyer's market uh, and that there will be an excess in supply capacity, which is a good time to buy. It's a good time to be buying power. Number five, there's an opportunity to lock in fuel costs at lower levels. According to Florida Gas Utility, it's an opportune time to lock in fixed price supplies to reduce price volatility for the future. <coughs> so those are the pros. And the cons, you're going to see in this presentation all of the concerns and comments that came up. 
these are our top five. As you're going to see in this presentation, there are a lot of deeper issues that we really can no longer afford to let not be addressed. So we're going to get into those. But the, the first con relates to that. Uh, this it ties the community contractually to years in the future while existing problems go unaddressed. Number two, it requires a second tie line. The estimated cost of that tie line is $10 million. So, and we'll talk about that. You probably have a lot of questions about that, and I would encourage you to ask us about that, because this is a big deal. Number three, it continues to transfer to the general fund. Now, I know this commission has made a concerted commitment, uh, and it has, in fact, reduced the transfers to the general fund. And I know you're committed to continuing to have that reduction. However, the future commissions could, in fact, reinstate it. It doesn't address the issue. Number four, continues the underutilization of existing assets, such as the existing natural gas line that we spent a lot of money to put in. Number five, the probability of higher costs to reserve power issues in the future. We know that this play is able to get access to quite a bit of predicting models for the future costs of purchasing power, and they all show drastic rising costs. It won't be possible to lock in pricing that covers that period of time. So eventually, we'll have to pay the piper. <coughs> you will have a contract that will expire, and you could very well find yourself in a market that's not favorable for buying power. So that's, um, those are the pros and cons for the purchase power. Commissioner, questions on the purchase power? Sure. Vice Mayor? Okay, yeah, let's go back to the, uh, the tie line. Um, I'm, I'm hearing things in the community, I'm hearing things that maybe um, there's a little of a glitch that we weren't expecting something to do with land. I'm sorry, something to do with land. We don't own the land. We don't have the land to do this. Is that correct? We, we don't have the right of way. We, we don't have um, the permission to access the tie-in. We would have to gain that permission. And that could be from private property owners, it could be from other municipalities. There are agreements that have to be involved in that that are pretty extensive. And how does that impact your mayor? Wait. Sorry, how does that impact the, the timeline um, for this type of an option? Obviously, because you have a huge unknown here. We definitely you, do. You're talking to local agreements and, and other types of uh, contracts. So what does that do to your timeline overall? Well, um, well, first, let me speak to the importance of this issue and then put it in the context of the timeline. We now have one line into the city. We just, and th this is the only way I can understand it because this is very complicated to me. But, um, you know, picture kind of this uh, access point <coughs> that comes from OUC over FPNL lines, we buy the power, power comes shooting up the road, and then it, we take it down via a tie line. We pull that power down via the tie line into the city, and it's stepped down into uh, various components and voltage levels. That tie line is the only way that we can get that outside power. And it's recently needed quite a few repairs. If that tie line goes down, we're dark. So that's not a good place to be. What about our own capability? Our own capability yeah. to reduce power? We have limited capabilities. 
So we could supply some power. We could probably supply power to our emergency services. But we certainly couldn't supply power to the entire city. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> it, that is all dependent on, on conditions, and typically weather conditions. So for, uh, I'm saying about 60% of the time, if all of our units are fully functional, we can supply power to the entire city. Uh, if the weather is such that our load exceeds our capacity at the plant, or if we lose one of the plants for whatever reason, then we have that uh, contingency that says we are no longer capable of supplying all of our load. Vice Mayor, did you want to follow up with that? Well, yes, I will. And, and again, we all recognize that if we have to stand alone, and generate our own power, the cost of that electricity is much, much higher. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Much, much higher than what we can buy on the open market. Uh, at, at today's rates, yes. The other issue is the more that we use this plant, the faster we um, draw a bit, we, we close that gap at, uh, over its serviceable life because, number one, we're running out of parts. Is that correct? That is correct. So we only have, what, a couple more, three or four years left of part? Availability is that what I the the industry trend average for power plants is somewhere in the thirty to forty year time frame. Uh, our plants are older than that. Uh, they are pretty well maintained, and so far they've been very reliable. But there does come a point when when your your old units, be it a car, be it a, a frying pan, be it a power plant, be it a transmission line, will we'll give up. Thank you. The tie line. Um, first of all, thank you for identifying it and, and moving us forward in that direction. But why have we not ever heard about this? Is this an FPL tie line or is this our tie line? I, I cannot answer that question. Uh, for the time frame that I've been here, uh, that it's always been one single tie line. I'm speculating now, which I don't like to do, but I am. That as long as we had our own generation. It wasn't a big deal. Are we somewhat outgrown that generation? And we've taken a different approach towards supply side into the city with, uh, with outside purchase power agreements and with outside ownership of the St. Lucie and Stamps plants. Okay, because we, I mean, going through everything that we went through with RFPs and going through all the different options, this is the first time we've ever heard, no. or I've ever heard of. They talk, it, uh, we no, talked about been, the last time yeah. around. That was the only yeah. time that it was mentioned yeah, during but, the discussions. You know, I didn't know that, you know, it didn't, it, and it really didn't sound like it was a major important. Not as important as this that's being discussed today. Exactly. Commissioner McCoy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think, with all due respect, Commissioner Amoroso, we, we have talked to numerous times that our arrangement with the city is that we have had the ability for a long time to generate power internally, but you always want to be interconnected to the broader network, whether it's to sell power out, or to bring power in, or to make choices. It, sometimes it's cheaper to buy power than to generate yourself, so you want that flexibility. You want to be tied in, and we have been for a long time. And we've known that there was just one tie coming in, and that's not an unreasonable situation, particularly if you have your own power. It might be interesting to ask, you know, does Lantana have more than one tie line, and they don't even have the ability. If, if it goes down, they got nothing. Whereas we've gone, as, as Clay has told us various times, uh, we're a little quiet about it, but we've gone island, as they call it, a number of times. And um, it, it means that we, we are in it, and I've mentioned that at other meetings, that we're in an unusual position that if the rest of the world decides they don't want to send us any power, we, we still can keep a lot of things going. We can keep the whole city going, except you know at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in August, we might not make it all the way there. Um, and even that, I would point out that there are examples of cities that are in exactly that situation that in the space of a day or, or several days drastically reduce their consumption. And I don't know if Clay knows about this one, but I actually talked to the operators in Juneau, Alaska. In, uh, it wasn't fully in the winter, but it was, it was still cold and they had an avalanche that knocked out their hydropower and their backup was diesel. And they all knew that running diesel 
was not a happy situation. It was going to cost them a lot more. And they lowered their city's consumption by about 40%, 30, 40% in in very, very short period. So, you know, if we have to, we have options. Um, we're not going to go dark. So we want to be careful about overstating that. Obviously, if you can have two tie lines and it doesn't cost you anything, yeah, sure, you know, that's a nice idea. But it's not quite as drastic as, as you know, that the thing's going to go out tomorrow. It's also, I think we talked about it before, have we ever had any, uh, any where that thing actually went down? And I think the answer you gave us before was, I don't think it ever has fully gone down in a hurricane right. today. No, I, I think that the last time the, was was a crane that fell through the transmission line. And I don't understand. I don't. I wasn't here. I don't know what all the consequences and choices of that that were. I'm, I'm assuming again that the power plant at that point provided all of the requirements for the city. Yeah. But that was a few years ago. When it was a little a little more functional. Let's keep the train on track here. The fact of the matter is the fact that if, if those power, if those generators that we have at the plant, which are many of which installed in what the 1960s, yes. Okay. If we lose the generators, we, we can't generate our own power. So that's something to think about. It's not serious because they're running fine, but that is the fact that that's one of the issues, the realities that we're facing right now. Vice Mayor. Okay. Okay. Any other questions in regards to the alternatives? Commissioner Rosso? Um, real quick, the transfer to general funds, um, yes, this commission and mayor are, are looking at weaning, um, but we're kind of at that point now, you know, we've cut, we've cut, we've cut, we can't do much. Um, I, I know periodically we give you direction. Um, I had said years ago when, when Rodney was here, what are other municipalities doing that we're not doing? You know, I'd really like to take a look at the municipalities that are around us that don't have their own utilities. What are they doing to balance their budget that we may not be doing or, or we may add? Because, again, we're going to need your help um, to, to help at this point because we, we've, we've weaned and we're still continuing to wean, but we're kind of at that point where we need a little, little bit more help, and that might be something that um, you guys can look at for us. Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. I think some of that, maybe from my impression, is there's a ratio between the amount of services that you need to give for your population and their demands versus that population's ability and their property values to contribute to pay for those services. And that ratio is not anywhere near that's right. around us. Right. So there might not be a whole lot else of cutting and trimming that you can do other than they just don't balance out because you have a lot more services required for the population you have than the revenue that's generated, okay? Period. Um, now, to, in, in, in defense of that, I mean, it is a great goal and they're looking to be more efficient. The asset that we're talking about, that, that natural gas line, we're, we're using some of that now. I mean, there's some natural gas that's available to us. Natural gas is available to us. It, it's actually two, two separate issues. One is the gas line itself, and the other is the uh, contract for the commodity gas. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the commodity gas is available to us through dispatch when we are called upon to run our plants. We could also call upon that gas for our own services <coughs> if, we, if we saw saw another need. The Capital investment in the pipeline itself is an ongoing expense. Um, that that's just sitting cost. there. Yes. Is that sixty-four thousand dollars a month? Yes, it is. Uh, well, that's a pretty close number. I don't know the exact number, but it's it's in the six hundred thousand dollar a year. To do nothing. To so that, that that's the point I was getting at. Is that I don't know if it, we would call it an underutilization because you still have to put money into this thing for nothing at the. It, for the ability to potentially use it in the future. I mean, we're still, it's not like it's just sitting there not being used. It's there and we're still having to, to keep paying for something for the potential. That that decision was made a long time ago and, there, and this is not marrying up. So that's a different situation in my mind from underutilization, it's just, uh, an anticipation that we went, 
maybe went wrong, if, depending on what, what choice uh, rises up here and becomes uh, the better one. Um, so in, in, is it the amount that we pay for our own fuel, so we cannot purchase that fuel uh, in a better situation than buying it from somebody else. I mean, if you had our own plant, and you're looking at this of buying long-term power versus fixing or improving the plant here and having to buy fuel, right, obviously the reason why it's not cheaper because of the age and the efficiency of the equipment we have now. The, the price of the fuel is a minor piece of that equation. Right. It's the efficiency of the units. All right. So the cost to, it says resolve power, but I mean, that's, it's not the, the fuel purchase price. That's not, that's not exactly the, so I just wanted to clarify that because you still, Someone's going to still buy it no matter what, then if you buy it from somebody else, it's their level of efficiency and markup versus our own ability to produce it ourselves. The, if, if I can clarify that, our plants have dual fuel capabilities. You can run them on, well not all of them, but for the most part you can run them on either diesel fuel or natural gas, depending on economics or operational considerations. Obviously, at this point in time, when fuel is in the four dollar and fifty cent range, gas, I'm sorry, gas is in the four dollar and fifty cent range, and diesel is in the uh, dollars per gallon range. The natural gas is obviously a better choice. Um, when the gas spiked at the ten dollar piece, obviously that was that was uh, we saw a lot of coal generation in those days, as well as oil oil generation. So right now, gas. Is, is low, and there is an opportunity to lock that in for the next five years. You pay a, a small premium for that, for that uh, long-term contract as opposed to buying it on the open market. And indulge me one more. Sure. When we look at the contribution to the general fund, if we were to just uh, dream for a second and go, we're not taking anything from the electric font, you know, the production, and <clears throat> what what rate would our rate be, just in general terms, if we didn't have to supplement the general fund, all right, we somehow we did get enough money some other way here, but just for a second, I, I want to just look at that, what would be that level compared to what we're paying now? And if you, you did have to allow me to do a little bit of math in my head. <laughs> sure. You can do better than me. Assuming, assuming all the administrative charges remain the same, in other words, we contribute to the... They're not going away. Yes. The transfer to the general fund is just a shade over 8%. So for a $50 million operation, 8% of that is $4 million. Um, so we could cut our rates by, well, cut our rates by 8%.